On a hazy evening in 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. was flying his wife and his sister-in-law to his cousin's wedding in Martha's Vineyard when his Piper Saratoga that he was piloting crashed in, into the Atlantic Ocean. All three were killed instantly. Upon investigation of what caused the accident, it was concluded that Kennedy had fallen victim to something called spatial disorientation. Spatial disorientation occurs when the pilot loses a visual frame of reference, when he can't see the horizon or the ground clearly, conditions that might occur if you fly into a cloud bank or if you're flying on a hazy night over dark waters. And what happens is that when the visual frame of reference is lost, the pilot's inner ear and eyes start sending conflicting messages. And they actually stop being truthful. They stop being reliable. They tell him he's flying wings level when in actuality he has begun to slowly bank the aircraft to turn it and to actually descend. His body can't detect any of this physiologically. And so he's confused when he looks at his instruments and the altimeter and it tells him that he's, he's, he's starting to descend. And so what he'll do is he'll, he'll pull up because he's starting to descend, but he doesn't realize that he's banking. And when you try to pull up while you're in a turn, it just sends the plane into a steeper dive. Still, he can detect none of this um, in his body. This is something called a graveyard spiral that starts to happen. This phenomenon is so tricky and it's so powerful, it can come on so quickly that a pilot can go from flying in safe flying conditions with a visual point of reference to becoming disoriented and to crashing to the ground in just 178 seconds, less than three minutes. The solution to that phenomenon is actually quite simple. You trust your instruments. You believe what they say and what they tell you is true more than what you feel is true. Life or death in that situation hinges on where that pilot believes truth is found in that minute, on what his body is feeling or on what his instruments are telling him. John F. Kennedy Jr.'s aircraft actually had the instruments to be able to tell him everything that was going on with that aircraft, but he hadn't been trained to use them. He wasn't instrument rated. And that, that they could have saved his life. The time for JFK Jr. to learn how to use those instruments and rely on them in conditions like that was not in that moment when he was spatially disoriented. It was not in those 178 seconds. It was before that moment came. And his lack of training in that area cost him his life. When we find ourselves in a trial, when we have lost sight of our horizon in life, do we rely more on what we feel or on what we know? And trials can do this. They can obscure our normal visual point of reference really quickly. And the things that we thought were certain yesterday are suddenly not certain at all. And the people that we thought we could depend on yesterday have suddenly abandoned us. Our response to those trials, whether we stay wings level or whether we start to drift into a bank without realizing it or into a dive, they hinge on where we believe truth is found in that moment. The time for us to prepare for trials, just like John F. Kennedy Jr., is not the day they arrive. It is not when we find ourselves in the middle of a cloud bank. Um, it is every day before. This morning, earlier, we looked at some saints in the Bible for whom God had appointed difficult trials. And we observed how in his goodness and wisdom, God is often pleased to provide endurance rather than escape for his saints in the midst of their trials. So our question before us today is if that's the case, if God has ordained trials to come to each of us, then, then how are we supposed to respond when they do come? So we're going to get to look at a few more saints in the Bible and see how they responded to trials. Your outline is a little bit turned around. The first point we're going to do at the end, just to give you a heads up there. The first two points, actually, we're going to do at the end. Just like the example with John F. Kennedy Jr., we're going to see just how important it is for us to be prepared before the day of trouble comes and to know how to respond to trials before they come. What we know about God does indeed inform our response to trials one way or the other. So what do you know about God? If a trial came today, what do you know to be true about God and where would truth be found? We are going to talk first about Job. So if you turn your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to Job chapter one. Um, I know that someone much older and wiser than I did, not much older, <laughs> much wiser, a little bit older 
much wiser. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, has already, he already spent six weeks on Job, and it was fantastic. Um, we're going to look specifically at what, uh, how Job responded to his trial, and really what he knew before the day of trouble came that informed his response to his trial. Job was one of the richest men of his day. He lived a long time ago, probably at the same time um, as Abraham. And his wealth was measured not in silver or gold. It was measured in livestock. It was measured in camels and sheep and donkeys and servants. He had a wife and 10 children, and he had status. He was respected among his community. And he was a righteous man. And so but really, before the book of Job tells us anything about, about him, anything else about him, it says that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. And we hear the Lord say the same thing about Job in verse 8 of chapter 1, and when he's addressing Satan, and he says, have you considered my servant Job? He's a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And part of how Job was blameless and upright is, is this habit that he was in with trusting God with all the things that he had. Um, he would rise early in the morning and he would worship and offer sacrifices to God, not just on his behalf, but on behalf of his 10 children. So an observation here before we see his trial is that Job was already in the habit of trusting God with everything he had. He didn't wake up the morning that disaster came and say, you know what, today is the day that I'm gonna start trusting God with everything that I have. He'd been in the habit of doing this for a long time. And Job 1.5 says about this practice of Job um, to sacrifice and worship the Lord, that it says, thus Job did continually. So the, the lesson here for us is that if you are waiting for the day of trial to start trusting God with everything that you have, everything that you own, everyone in your family, um, you will be caught off guard when it comes and you will find yourself unprepared. The day you lose everything is not the day that you will decide to crack open that book by John Owen or that systematic theology volume. I have a friend who says, um, a pastor in Florida that says, it is too late in the middle of a trial to retrofit a theology. The time to decide what you believe that is true about God is not, that's your theology, right? What we know is true about God. And the time to decide what our theology is, is not in the middle of a trial. That's too late. It's before it comes. The day came where Job lost everything. So read with me in Job chapter one, starting in verse 13. It says this, now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young people and they are dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. So within minutes of each other, messenger after messenger comes, each with worse news than before. Job, you've lost your oxen. Job, you've lost your donkeys. Job, you've lost your sheep. Job, you've lost your camels. Job, you've lost your servants. Job, you've lost your children. Job has suddenly lost everything he owns and everything, his livelihood, and he's lost his children. And this was a trial for Job. So how did Job respond to this trial? We see his response in Job verse, or chapter one, verse 20. It says this, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. Job had just experienced catastrophic loss and his response was to worship. Now why? What did Job know was true about God before this day that led him to respond to losing everything with worship. Read with me what he declares about God in the next verse. This is Job's theology. Verse 21 says, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb 
and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. What did Job know about the Lord before the day of trouble? Well, he knew that God was sovereign, right? You hear that word sovereign, it's kind of a big theological sounding word sometimes, but we think of a king, it's got the idea of a king in there, right? The word reign is right in the word sovereign. And a sovereign or a king has complete dominion, complete control over all that which is in his domain. And Job says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Job knew that it was God who had given him all that he had in the first place and that it was his prerogative to take it all away. Job knew that the Lord was sovereign. And consider for a moment the scope of God's sovereignty that Job is proclaiming here. Think about the varied ways in which his possessions and his family were lost. Think about the planning that it would take for the Sabaeans to carry off a thousand oxen and donkeys. Or how much planning it would take for the Chaldeans to make a successful raid on 3,000 camels. That's a lot of camels. I've never even seen, I've only seen four camels in the zoo. It's 3,000 camels. Think about what kind of severe fire would have to fall from heaven to incinerate 7,000 sheep and the servants keeping them. And then think about the kind of wind speed, the kind of destructive wind force that would have to collapse a house and kill all of its inhabitants. Job is attributing the theft of animals, the murder of men, the evil designs of men's hearts, and natural disasters to God's scope of sovereign reign. Now we know that Satan was behind these actions, so we could also say that Satan himself is also under that same umbrella of God's sovereign reign. He is well under God's control. A disease, as we know, comes next for Job. Painful boils break out on his body. And he responds similarly. He says, shall we accept good from God and not evil? And so we could also say that there is not a molecule of disease that is outside the scope of God's sovereignty. And Job isn't wrong about ascribing these things to, to the Lord, to Yahweh, right? He declares the same thing about himself. Deuteronomy 32, 39, we find the Lord saying this about himself. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Isaiah 45, six and seven says, I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does these things. And Psalm 115, three, one of my favorite verses says, our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. Throughout the Bible, God declares himself to be God. And here in America, sometimes we don't, we don't want to hear that God brings bad things, but that is exactly what he does sometimes. I mean, have you read the Bible? Do you see what God did to the land of Egypt when he brought the Israelites out with all of those plagues? That, that land was, was a waste by the time he was done with it. According to his wise and good purposes, God does sometimes bring bad things. And this reality about the sovereignty of God a God who is in control of every act of man, every theft, every loss, every disease, murder, natural disaster, who is ultimately in control over them, that reality will either be terrifying to you or it will be extremely comforting. If you would say here this morning that you are not in Christ, then this truth about God's sovereignty is and ought to be weighty and terrifying. Because if you have made the God of the universe your enemy, you need to know that he is no small king. He is no passive sovereign. He is Yahweh. He is the Lord. And your life is well within his domain, just like mine is. But if you are here and you would say that you are in Christ, then this facet of God's character, his sovereignty, should provide so much comfort. Because that same all-powerful and sovereign God, he offers to be your refuge and your strength. And he offers to be your help in time of trouble. That same power at his disposal against his enemies is available to you to help you against yours. Romans 8, 31 is the battle cry of every Christian, right? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, believer, then who can be against you? What force on earth can prevail over you? And even more comforting than the sovereignty of God and his power available to you is his love that he has set on you in his son. Verse 35 of Romans 8 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amidst all these threats of calamity and destruction, what can you lose in this world that feels so uncertain at some times with all of its anxieties and all of its fears and all of its frightening prospects? What can we actually lose if we have the love of Christ? And what can we never be separated from but it? He is not just your king. If you are in Christ, he is your heavenly father who loves you and you will never be separated from that love. We serve a God who is so sovereign that whenever we plead with him about the various things going on in our life, we know that there is not a single one of them that he cannot reverse or change or make into something absolutely wonderful. This is what happened with Job at the end of the book. God restored twice as much to Job as he had at the beginning. But if he does not restore to you what you have lost, if he does not change your situation, you can rest assured that it is not for a lack of God's power or ability that your circumstances remain unchanged, but it is unquestionably his purpose, his good purpose, and that that purpose is rooted in love for you. Where there's something better for you than your present circumstances and trial, rest assured your father who loves you would give you that instead. Two years ago, when I went through something difficult, I will tell you, this truth of God's sovereignty sustained me because there are difficult and frightening things in this world. We are called to fear none of them because the, we know the one who is over all of them. What did Job know about God on the day he lost everything? He knew that God was sovereign. But Job knew something else about God on this day. He knew that regardless of his personal circumstances, that Yahweh, that God was still worthy to be praised. Read with me Job 121 it says this, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and he worshiped. So we see Job again, worshiping God. Job knew that his God was good and worthy to be praised regardless of his circumstances. In good circumstances, in bad circumstances, and this truth caused him to worship when disaster befell him. He was still distressed. Job is grieving. He is tearing his clothes. He's shaving his head. He's, he is prostrate on the ground, but he's still worshiping. And he declares, blessed be the name of the Lord. And this is more than just accepting his circumstances. This is more than Job just not grumbling or complaining against the Lord. This is him saying in essence, yes, today I have lost everything, but I know that God is the one who gave me what I had in the first place and it is his prerogative to take it away. He has done me no wrong. I blessed his name yesterday and I will bless his name today because he has not changed. He is still worthy to be praised and worshiped. Do you do this? Is this how you respond to losing things on this earth? When you lose your health for a while or your job or your keys, do you worship the Lord in that moment? Is that your first response? It's not always mine when I lose my keys. Do we say you are still worthy to be praised? Job went through a great trial. Do you know how this, the New Testament sums up this man's life? It's such a contrast to what we looked at earlier with Ahab, just the summary of his life being wickedness. And what James 5.11 says about Job's life is this, behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Job's faith was made steadfast as a result of this trial. And do you see that the purpose of the Lord in it that James is declaring is compassionate and it's merciful? Do you trust in your trial that God has a purpose for you and that that purpose is actually compassion and mercy towards you? Job went through a terrible trial. He responded with worship and his faith was made steadfast. The second person we're gonna look at is Jeremiah, if you wanna to turn to Lamentations chapter three. This passage is precious to me. Jeremiah, like Elijah, lived during a dark time. 
the nation of Israel had once again forsaken the Lord and gone after other gods. And they had earned God's wrath and judgment to such an extent that destruction is coming. But year after year, God sends his prophets to warn them, to call them back. He's warning them, hey, if you don't repent, the ba- a nation is going to come and they're going to destroy you. And yet often in the same breath, Jeremiah's message was not just judgment and destruction, but it was a plea for them to turn back and an offering of pardon and compassion and relenting of that judgment if they did. Jeremiah's job was to communicate these warnings to a people who had wholly turned away from the Lord and they wanted to hear nothing about him if it wasn't in their favor. And he was obedient to the Lord in this and they did not listen. And early, in, early on in Jeremiah's ministry, God had actually told them that the people wouldn't listen to him. And I imagine that was discouraging. He was persecuted and mocked for these um, prophecies in the Lord's name. He was thrown in prison. He was belittled. And then the day came where God was faithful and kept his promise. And the Babylonian army came. They actually came twice. It came the first time, they set siege to Jerusalem and the city fell. They carried captives some away and they left it under Babylonian rule. But 10 years later, um, the king of Jerusalem tried to revolt against that Babylonian rule. And so the army came back and they set siege to it again. They cut the land off from all natural resources and caused a famine so severe um, for months and months. And the city fell again, and it was finally burned and destroyed. Jeremiah had to endure the ridicule of his contemporaries, slander from his countrymen, imprisonment, and then he had to watch his kinsmen besieged and attacked, carried into slavery, his homeland destroyed. During parts of that famine that was so severe, he had to watch mothers eating their own children. Jeremiah saw famine and death and terrible things. And he wrote a book called Lamentations that is full of the agony of his circumstances. Jeremiah was in a trial. How did he respond to this trial? What did he know about God before the day of trouble came that sustained him in the midst of it? Well, for one, Jeremiah also knew that God was sovereign over his circumstances. The first two chapters of Lamentations, we find verses like this. It was the Lord who gave Jerusalem into the hands of those she could not withstand. That in destroying Jerusalem, we find him saying, the Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. Jeremiah knew that God was sovereign, that he was in control of all of this, and that it was his will to bring it about. I mean, he had been delivering that message for years and years. But look, this was still very, very difficult circumstances for Jeremiah. They were painful, these circumstances for him. So we're going to look for a moment, not at what Jeremiah knew, but at what he felt. Because Jeremiah had emotions, and the book of Lamentations is, is filled with them, especially the two chapters leading up to this one. In 116, Jeremiah says, For these things I weep, my eyes flow with tears. In 120, he cries, Look, O Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns, and my heart is wrung within me. In 3.1, he says, I am the man who has seen affliction. And we find the summary of Jeremiah's emotional state in 3.17 through 18, where he says this. He says, my soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Jeremiah had feelings. He had emotions. And he wrote a whole book about them. He was in a trial. And how did he respond? Well, after two chapters filled with laments, we see something remarkable. Read with me our passage in Lamentations 3.21. After saying his endurance has perished and his hope, so is his hope from the Lord. And how he remembers those things. He says this, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. So stop for a second. Do you see what he's doing? He's not ignoring his emotions, right? But he is calling something to mind. He's reining them in. He is remembering something that is true regardless of his circumstances or his emotions. 
And that which he is remembering, that which he is calling to mind, it gives him hope. Hope that he had said just a second ago had perished. And what is it? Verse 22 says this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah was in a severe trial. And how did he respond? With truth. Truth about who God was. Truth about God's character. Truth that he had known long before this day of trouble. In the midst of terrible grief, Jeremiah remembers the steadfast love of his God. He calls to mind how he promised it would never cease. And he remembers the mercy of God. He calls to mind that although God had brought the punishment that he had promised, that he'd also promised that his mercies would never come to an end, that they would be new every morning. And Jeremiah remembered the faithfulness of God, that the same God who had been faithful to keep his promise for the destruction of Jerusalem would be just as faithful to keep his promises for their restoration. Jeremiah knew these things before the day of trouble. He knew where truth was to be found and he relied on it when he could not see the horizon. He, this was the God who had declared himself before Moses in Exodus 34, who he was, right? He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is who our God is and Jeremiah remembers it when he can't see it and when he doesn't feel it, he knows that it is still true. He knew the character and the promises of the God who was giving him this trial and this affliction. And in the sea of his despair, when he lost all sight of the horizon, he knew where truth was found and he held on to it. In the next verses, 24 and 25, he says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Do you see the power of truth here? Jeremiah goes from his hope perishing to remembering these truths and saying, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait him for the soul who seeks him. The Lord is Jeremiah's portion. He is all that he has and he is enough. And Jeremiah chooses not to despair, not because of that which his eyes can see, but because of the hope which they cannot. So what he does here with his emotions and limitations has been so helpful for me during a particularly difficult season in my life, I, when everything um, felt very, very uncertain, life and death, I would often say my thoughts are like wild horses threatening to, to drag me away with them and I would have to rein them in all the time. They would want to think about every possibility of a bad outcome, every anxiety, the worst case scenario, every fear. And I had to constantly rein those thoughts in again and again and again, just like what Jeremiah does here. So this text for me was such a help. And emotions are not bad things. I mean, God gave us our emotions. And when submitted to him, they are wonderful expressions of who we are. But if we do not rule over our emotions, they will rule over us. And they will trap us. And they will back us into very dark corners from which it will be difficult to extricate ourselves. Think for a moment what the absence of truth looks like in the middle of a trial, in Jeremiah's case or in our case. In hard circumstances, in a trial, if your mind isn't stayed on truth, where do our emotions naturally lead us? Probably to places like despair or bitterness or anger or anxiety or depression. You might start to bank just a few degrees without realizing it, but then quicker than you might think, you'd be in a graveyard spiral. And the only thing that this world can offer us when we are in those dark places are prescriptions or, or distractions. And I'm here to tell you that there is a way out of that place. And it might not be escape from your trial, but it is something that is mighty to help you bear up under it and endure through it and emerge on the other side of it. But if you are down in that pit of emotions in the midst of your trial this morning, um, here is a rope to hold on to. It is, it is a rope of truth and it will never fail and it will never fray. But you do have to hold on to it, just like Jeremiah. You have to go back to it. You have to call it to mind. And you have to climb to get out of that place by calling the same truth to mind over and over again, by putting your hope in the God that Charles Spurgeon once said was too good to be unkind and, and too wise to err. By making him and him alone your portion and, and, and by waiting on him like Jeremiah. And look, none of us do this perfectly. I do not. 
Every woman in this room has at one point or another allowed her emotions to eclipse truth, right? This is just part of being fallen creatures and still having our flesh dwelling within us and sin. Job did this for 30 chapters. Um, we are all weak. We are all fallible. And we all get into those places sometimes. And we need each other to remind each other where that rope of truth is found and to keep holding on to it because sometimes we forget. Like Elijah in the wilderness, we just forget. We need help. And God is so kind to give us that help. And he does that through the body of Christ often. Believe what you know to be true over what you feel. Do we do this? In the midst of your trial, do you grab onto the truth that God's steadfast love for you will never cease? That neither trial or affliction or suffering can ever separate you from it. That his mercy will never run out for you, no matter how many times you mess it up. If you mess it up again and again and again, his mercy will never run out. It'll be new every single morning. Do you call to mind that he will be faithful to keep the promises he has made to you in Christ Jesus and that he will never leave you or forsake you? Do you remind others of these precious truths when they are struggling? When they are going through trials, where is the hope that you point them to? If your hope is in changing your circumstances or in escaping your trial alone, then one day it will fail you. But if your hope is in these things, if your portion is in the Lord, it will never fail because he never does. It'll be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. This is something else that I tell myself that encourages me. In Matthew 7, Jesus gives a parable and he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And there was also a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Um, and look, the rains might fall and the floods might come and the winds might blow and beat on that house. And the promise is, is that it won't fall. The promise is not that storms won't come. The promise is not that, that, that Jesus will give you a portable house, which you can move when storms come because storms came to both of those houses. The promise is just that it won't fall, that that foundation won't move. When Jeremiah's feelings were threatening to pull him down and drag him away, he held on to the rope of truth. He went through a terrible trial and he responded with truth. Lastly, we're gonna look at one more person who went through a trial and see how they responded. We are going to get to look at the one whom every Old Testament saint looked forward to and the one to whom we will always look back. We are going to look at Jesus. So turn with me to Matthew 26. You could say that Jesus' trial began, certainly it did, when he left the eternal glory he'd always shared with the Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven. He came to this earth. Scott did a great job of walking us through this last night. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He was always around sin and he never gave into it. He was always holy and righteous and unblemished and unstained. And he had suffered before the night we're about to read about in Matthew chapter 26. But on the eve of his crucifixion, we see far worse suffering than anything we could ever imagine or talk about because we see the suffering of the Son of God. And here in Gethsemane, Jesus isn't just contemplating the physical suffering or the humiliation that will come the next day. But he's contemplating um, the cross. He's contemplating not just being around sin anymore, but, by, but actually becoming it. And his holiness, all that he is as the son of God and the second person of the Godhead revolts against that. And it isn't just that. He knows it's not just becoming sin, but it is suffering the wrath of his father against that sin. Each and every sin for every person who would ever believe in him. And he's in turmoil in this garden. Matthew tells us that he began to be sorrowful and trouble. Mark says he was greatly dis distressed. And Jesus himself says, my soul is sorrowful even to death. And so many times before, as you're going to see in this passage, Jesus had sought solitary places to be alone and to pray. But this night he says, remain with me. This burden was great and he didn't want to be alone. And if we were to ever have an, a, an example of how to respond to trials, this would be it. The son of God became a man and went through the greatest trial the world has ever known or will ever know. And as believers, we have to ask and we must know how did he respond? He goes a few paces away, he falls on his face and he prays. And in Matthew 26, verse 36, Um, verse 37, we'll start there. It says this, 
And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. And we're stop there for a minute. The first thing that we see him do is beseech his father for any other way to accomplish his task, to complete that role that Scott talked about last night. Jesus cries out as Mark records, I have a father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Jesus' circumstances were so agonizing that he desires escape, but not in the way that Joseph did or Elijah did or Paul did. Well, because they were sinners. And, and their motives couldn't help but be mixed with selfish motives. But Jesus was sinless. And nevertheless, his holiness and everything in him is so anguished by the task ahead that he pleads with his father for any other way. And he does this three times. What does that tell us about the degree of sorrow and suffering that our Savior endured on our behalf? This is why he had come. That he came to seek and save the lost. He knew this was the whole reason he had left heaven for this very hour. And yet when this hour comes, he asks for any other way for the task to be accomplished. But listen to what he says in the same breath. And let's finish the rest of that verse. He says in verse 39, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. How did Jesus respond to this? The most severe trial we could ever talk about, not my will, but yours be done. Not as I will, but as you will. See how perfectly the son submits his will to the father. He expresses a desire for relief from his circumstances while still keeping his will in perfect alignment with the father's. We see the request, but also the relinquishing. We see the supplication and earnestly so, but we also see the surrender. Jesus was in the greatest trial the world had ever known, and he responded with perfect submission. And what did Jesus know about his father on this day? Well, he knew well the sovereignty of his father, right? All things are possible for you. And he knew his father's character and promises perfectly. And he knew that his father's will in that moment was better than even his own, and he trusted him in that perfectly. Do we do this? Do we submit our requests to the one who already knows them and then bring our wills into alignment with his in the same breath? Do we trust that his plan is better than our own? This is our example for how we are to respond to trials. First Peter 2.21 says, for this to suffering, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. We look to Christ when we suffer because he suffered more than we ever could to spare us far worse suffering than we will ever see in this life. See, no matter how much suffering we experience in this life, it will still be far less than we deserve because we have sinned against a holy and infinite God and earned his holy and infinite wrath. Because according to the Bible, there are no good people. Romans 3.11 says that there is none righteous, no, not one. And as a result, what we deserve is eternal death. And what we deserve is hell. And this is what Christ suffered that day on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, sinless and still completely holy on the cross, became our vile, repugnant sins and fully served the sentence for each of them. We will never get what we do, do deserve because our Savior got that which he did not and he purchased something wonderful for us on the cross that day. He purchased eternal life, the hope of eternal life for us. That one day we will get to stand in the presence of our Savior, holy and blameless and clothed with his righteousness. And we will get to look at the scars on his hands and rejoice that he suffered our eternal death so that we could get his eternal life. That will be our song for all eternity. And it'll be a glorious song to sing. So when we look at the trials and sufferings of this life, we do not, as believers, think thoughts like, I don't deserve this. And we don't look at our friend or our family member who is suffering and think they don't deserve this because we know from scripture exactly what we all deserve and we're not getting it. Jesus was in the greatest trial that the world had ever known and he responded with perfect submission. 
We look to him and we know that we will never suffer in this life as much as he suffered for us to purchase for us an eternal hope, which all the trials and the tribulations and the suffering of this life can't touch. When trials come, do we worship like Job? And when affliction comes to meet us, do we call truth to mind like Jeremiah and hold on to it? When difficulty arises, are we quick to submit our will and to bring it into alignment with his like Jesus? We have to know before the day of trouble where truth is found. And it has to be more than just a knowing, right? We have to believe these things. We have to live by them and talk about our trials in light of them. We can't just look at the rope and know it's there. We have to be holding on to it every day so that when the floor falls out from under us, we are not lost. We can look at these examples and we can see how they responded, but in the New Testament, there's actually a very clear command of how we are to respond in trials that many of you are probably familiar with. Turn with me to James chapter one. We are familiar with this because Josh Kelso preached through the whole book of James earlier this year. James chapter one, verses two and three say this. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Some translations say endurance, perseverance. What this verse says is that our response to trials should be joy, and it's a command. Count trials joy, and not just any joy, but all joy. And that would lead us, of course, to ask, why would we do that? There are trials. <laughs> And it's because of what we know. In the second part of the verse, it says, for you know something, right? There is something that we know. We don't count trials joy because of what we feel. Trials never feel good. But we are we to respond to trials with joy because of what we know. And what is it that we know? It says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. What this is saying is that trials are designed by God to, to test something, to test our faith. If you think about the word trial, um, it's something that's designed to test something else, right? If you take car manufacturers, for example, they don't just make a car and sell it the next day, right? They have to be sure that that car is going to do exactly what they say that car is going to do. And in order to make sure this happens, they have to test it. So they send their cars to proving grounds and they put them through test after test and trial after trial. They test them for everything. Speed, we have a lot of proving grounds in Arizona. It's a great place to test cars for heat resistance. Cars, it's also a great place to test people for heat resistance. Um, these cars are tested for heat resistance. They're tested for speed and crash safety. And they're also tested for corrosion. Do you know that in order to make sure that a car won't rust before they say it will rust. This is one of the tests that they do. This is what Volkswagen does in the Arizona Proving Ground. They, they put a car into a climate-controlled garage called a hot box, and they fill it with a thick salt fog. If you were standing there, you couldn't even see your hand. The, the, the fog would be so thick. And they leave that car in there for 12 weeks. And by doing that, they are able to put 12 years of corrosion on that car in just 12 weeks. And then they go through the laborious process of pulling every single panel off of the car and checking it for rust. It is an intense and time-consuming process, but the car has to pass that trial before they sell it. It has to be tested. It has to be proven at the proving grounds. And what James 1 is saying is that the trials in this life are designed by God to be the proving grounds of our faith. I am convinced that one of the kindest things that God can give a person in this life is a trial. Because here's the thing, if your faith is never tested, how do you know if it's real? First Peter says something similar to this. It says, in our eternal inheritance, we rejoice, although now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, that is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Trials are designed by God to test our faith and to reveal it to be something eternally precious. And real faith, when tested, it produces something. Do you see that? It says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 
No one stands in awe of a house's foundation when it has not had to endure any serious weather. But everyone marvels at it when a hurricane comes and decimates every other house in the neighborhood except for that one house, and it is still standing. People say, wow, it's a strong foundation. It's a strong house. It was able to withstand a hurricane. Real faith, when tested, it's not only upheld by the God who gave it, but it is actually strengthened because you are able to see God's faithfulness in trials in a way which you never could without them. We could add to our thesis statement from the last session in this way. This is your second point on your outline. In his goodness and wisdom, God is often pleased to provide endurance rather than escape for his saints in the midst of trials in order to bring glory to his name and steadfastness to their faith. Trials produce something wonderful in the life of believer. They are designed by God to test that which he has given you, not so that he knows that it's real, but so that we do. And the command here is not to look for escape from the trial first and most, but to look for the endurance he promises to produce within it. John Piper, when he was diagnosed with cancer, wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Cancer. And I would plead with you, don't waste your trials. Even if they're small, small trials, God often gives us small trials. He's so kind to do that before he gives us big trials. I had so many small trials before I moved across the world to Papua New Guinea, which was a bigger trial. And even all of those trials now look so small compared to the trial that we went through a couple of years ago. He's so kind to do that. I learned so much through every single trial that God ever sent. I'm so thankful for every single trial that I experienced before the one two years ago, because he produced something through those trials. Don't waste your trials. We need to have hearts that say, God, whatever it is that you are trying to accomplish through this in this painful or difficult thing or relationship in my life, my family, my child, my marriage, my job, my school, my health, whatever it is, whether it lasts forever or whether it only lasts for a day, I will do this as long as it is producing something in me. And I count that joy. God does things in trials he does nowhere else, believer. And although no one wants to be in a hot box and hurricanes can be really frightening, the result is to marvel at how strong our foundation is and how faithful our God has proven himself to be. Now you say, yeah, but what does that look like in my everyday life? Can anyone actually respond like that? So I'm gonna give you one last example of a saint who responded to a trial, and he's not on your outline, but his life and his response to trial impacted mine greatly. His name was Matt Dodd, and he was my husband, and I don't think I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um, from 2005 until 2017, we got to be married for 12 years. We got to have four kids together. We got to train to go to the mission field together for a long time, it took like eight years. And then we actually got to do it. We got to move to the other side of the world to Papua New Guinea together with our four children and our two family teammates. And for two years, we got to learn one language and then move into a, a village to learn another one, all for the sake and the hope of the gospel with the goal ultimately being the Bible translated in that language and the gospel preached, souls being saved, but in January of 2017, while we were home on furlough, Matt had some strange symptoms and he got an MRI. And the MRI revealed over a dozen tumors in his brain. It was metastasized stage four lung cancer. It was a terminal diagnosis. And it came out of the blue for us, this diagnosis, because he was super healthy. He'd just been hiking all over this brutal terrain um, in Papua New Guinea. So, and our circumstances were a bit unusual because everything we owned was on the other side of the world. We were only gonna be here for a few months. So, I mean, really, everything we owned, all of our papers and photographs and furniture, it was all in a house, in a village, in a helicopter access only village. Um, it was almost as if in a day, we had lost our ministry, our future plans and hopes, and Matt suddenly had to prepare to lose his life, and we had to prepare to lose a husband and a father. Three weeks after that diagnosis, one of the tumors in his brain bled and that led to a stroke. He survived the stroke, but he woke up completely paralyzed on his left side. Um, God allowed us to get on a medicine that controlled the cancer long enough for him to recover from the stroke. And there was quite a bit of hope there for a moment. He was able to get back the feeling on his left side. He was able to learn how to walk again. Um, 
before relapse did come quickly. And this was a trial. So how did Matt respond to this in our current day, someone going through a trial? About a a week after the diagnosis, um, as the full weight of what he was facing settled on him, Matt wrote this in his journal. It's uh, dated January 22nd of 2017. He wrote this. God, it was a little bit hard for me yesterday to start to realize that probably a lot of people don't think I'm gonna make it through this. Almost like this is basically the sentence of death. I haven't felt like it's the sentence of death. I've thought this could be an opportunity to heal and be glorified in that way. And yet the sad, hard reality is that this could easily end in death. I mean, so many people have come before me with less cancer and have died. Yet I don't actually think this changes anything. It doesn't change how we should think and live and respond. Even if we do find out this is the worst kind of lung cancer there is, it doesn't change your goodness. Though I may want to fight and continue in ministry with my family and the world, that may not be your plan. And oh, it would be nice to come home. But oh, so sad for my family and friends. So I suppose the question in light of this is, what should I do today? How ought I to live? The same I'll live in heaven. The same I'd live without cancer. Praising you, worshiping you, knowing you more, fighting my sin and being oh so bold with the gospel. Please make me more bold with the gospel, God. Please may I speak oh so much more clearly. I pray that people will come to know you through this. Thank you for another day. Thank you for yesterday and the day before and to be able to spend it with my family. Please help me to be an encouragement to my brothers and sisters in Christ. What did Matt know about God that led to this response? He knew that God was sovereign over his cancer and that rather than thwarting the plans that he had for our family or for our work with the gospel in Papua New Guinea, that he was accomplishing them. It was a part of them. He preached a sermon while he was sick called Four Truths to Sustain a Dying Man. The four truths being, we have a hope in heaven. I will never suffer in this life as much as my Savior suffered for me. Christians love one another and God loves us. He counted this trial joy every single day. And my kids got to see that and so did I. A CAT scan in July of 2017 revealed that the cancer had spread. The doctor said he had four weeks to live. God knew it would only be two. The last conversation Matt had on this earth was with a friend who had caught a red-eye flight home from vacation to say goodbye. Matt was conscious less and less during this time. And so when that friend walked into the room, I wasn't sure how much Matt was gonna be able to communicate. Um, and Matt got all this energy and he turned to him and he said this. He said, but Kyle, we can still rejoice. Our inheritance is imperishable. It's undefiled, it's unfading. It's kept in heaven for us. And then he charged him to preach the gospel because he wasn't gonna be here anymore to do it. I might cry, I'm okay. This is not first and most the evidence of a faithful man, but of a faithful God who upheld that man and kept every promise he ever made to him, even onto his last breath. Matt knew where truth was to be found before the day of trouble came. And so when it did come, he was already holding onto that rope and it did not fail him. And his faith was made steadfast through that trial. A few years before he got sick, he preached a sermon on 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 about humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God when trials come and waiting for God to exalt us. And this is what he did when he was sick. He remembered that sermon. He humbled himself under that mighty hand and he waited for God to exalt him. And he did on July 18th, 2017, when Matt's faith became sight and he received that hope in heaven that was so dear to him on earth and he got to go home. In his goodness and wisdom, God is often pleased to provide endurance rather than escape for his saints in the midst of trials in order to bring glory to his name and steadfastness to their faith. I will tell you that it was an absolute privilege to go through what I went through two years ago. I got to see God be who he says that he is, do exactly what he promises to do. I will tell you that as a result of that trial, 
as terrible as it was <laughs> um, at times, my faith has been made more steadfast. I am not more afraid of the future. I am less afraid of the future because I know that when the next trial comes, that same God that didn't fail me two years ago, he won't fail me. He was faithful yesterday and he will be just as faithful today and tomorrow. We would never choose trials for ourselves, but God does. And he does it because he loves us, not in spite of his love for us, but because of it. And we can trust him in them. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. When trials come, when our horizon we cannot see, do we know where truth is found? Do we believe that truth and hold on to it when our eyes can't see? Is the sovereignty of God your refuge when difficult circumstances occur? Are the truths of his character, his steadfast love, and his mercy and his faithfulness, is that, is that the rope to which you cling when the day of trouble arrives? Do you lead your heart to Jesus and say, no matter how much I might suffer in this life, I will never suffer as much as he did for me to give me a hope that the trials of this life cannot touch. And when you suffer loss or you watch your friends suffer loss, sometimes great loss, do you submit your will to that one? And though you might tear your clothes and shave your head and fall on the ground and weep, do you worship because he is still worthy to be praised. I just wanna encourage you that if you are struggling to do this, if you are not presently holding on to that rope, it is there because he doesn't change, because truth doesn't change. If I were gonna reduce it all down, it would be this. And this is what I told myself during those months. If, if I believe in a God who is sovereign, over Matt's cancer or anything else. If I believe in a God that, he, that is good and a God who loves me and Matt and who loves us personally so much so that he did not spare his own son to save us, then why wouldn't my response to trial be worship, truth, submission, and if we know that God's design for us in trials is to make our faith steadfast so that we get to see that, so that we get to see his faithfulness to uphold it, then why wouldn't we count them all joy? We believe what we know over what we feel. Will you pray with me? Oh God, you are just so good. And even as I spoke these words just now, it is just, it is just still true. <laughs> it is still true. It is still, these truths are the same today as they were two years ago, as they were for Job and for Jeremiah, um, for Joseph. Oh God, you and your character are unchangeable. You are good and you are sovereign. And Lord, your love for us is, is not proven again by um, great and, and blessed circumstances, Lord, it was proven at the cross. And we are just so thankful to be un under that umbrella of your sovereignty that we can trust and know that if difficult things happen, they come from your hand who loves us, Lord. I just thank you for this time of rehearsing these truths to ourselves. And I just pray for myself and for every woman in this room that, that we would not just look at that rope of truth and know that it's there, Lord, that we would not just read words on a page, but God, that we would reach out and grab it, Lord, that our hope would not be um, in chariots and horses, but in the name of our Lord, who would, would never fail us. I just pray, Lord, for... Um, for this day that these truths would be deeply ingrained in our hearts once more because we need them so much and we need you and we thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. It's in the name of Jesus that we get to pray, amen.